so this is super exciting, um, and and I, I will do my very best to be <laughs> to um, to be nice and to um, to uh, not talk too much. But I mean, for me, there's no greater joy, a uh, few greater joys in life, childbirth and shit like that. But no, really, no greater joy than being around smart people, passionate about this thing. So before we sort of dive into this, I, I want to like make a, make a quick observation, right? I have this thesis that that companies and, and all these guys know this, so they can tell me where I'm wrong. But but companies um, succeed or fail uh, for a lot of reasons. But oftentimes they succeed when you partner with someone that has overlapping capabilities and values. In other words, hey, we're friends. Let's start a company together, right? Well, you kind of you do the same things. You don't need two people. Um, you always want to have overlapping values. In other words, we care about the same thing. And obviously, as we sit here at Berkeley College of Music, what we all care deeply about is sort of the arts with a capital A and music with a capital M and all those things. So, so we have the values. But if I, as I look at these three guys, um, and, and it is, is a bummer, and I must say, I'm violating George's first rule of panels. This is, in fact, a mantle. I'm sorry. Um, so um, we need to change that. Um, so if there are any females who would like to join. Um, so, um, so I look at these guys, and I, and I look at, at, at Panos, right, who has really spearheaded this whole initiative. Um, and um, he's, he's just sort of one of my heroes in the sense that he, he can move mountains with and get coalitions of, of unbelievably disparate people to get together around this common thread. And it truly is, is, a, is a gift, and, and it's this combination of energy and smarts, and, and that's so rare, right? And, and we'll talk more about that coalition. And then Dan, who, I mean, it's, it's hard to describe sort of the level of brilliance, but, and I wrote it down because Dan said this really great thing. He said, you know, his, his life has been this sort of collaboration and in inventing tech-based tools um, to enhance collaboration, right? So you bring him under the tent. And then you've got Michael, who, you know, quietly brilliant in his way in this, this sort of human-centered design. Three really different things going on that I think give, give um, the OMI a chance. Too often you have the same characters doing the same thing. So I want to make that observation. And then I want to second Nicole and welcome, and I know Pontus won't mind me doing this, welcome others into this tent. Like we, we, we're doing you know, the Jim Collins big, hairy, audacious goal here. What, what, what my opinion is we desperately need more sort of young artists sort of talking us through this. So thank you all for coming to this. I will try now to, to, to largely shut up a little bit. Um, I, I'll fail, but I'll try. But, um, but, but thanks for coming. And, and I want to start with you, Pontus. So talk a little bit about the sort of initial gesture. And I know this, and you can bypass someone like, oh, well, it grew out of rethink or whatever. I'd rather get more into like, well, like the why of this. What, what, what caused you to devote the countless time and hours to put us together and, and move this forward? What's driving that? Well, at its core is what we do here at Berkeley, you know. Um, I think that we live in an era where there has been um, an explosion of music consumption, an explosion of music creation. If you parachuted on planet Earth and um, somehow you had no context of what was going on in the music industry, you would think this is the best time ever to be alive, right? There is more music accessible through more places, more channels, more devices than any other time in the entire history. Yet for some reason, there's hardly a day where you don't go online or pick up a magazine or a newspaper or be on Twitter or whatever and not read another story about not enough money being driven to the people that are making music. That somehow, um, there's a paradox, right? There's a digital explosion and an explosion in consumption, but yet there's this incongruency of the people that are making the music are somehow not being compensated in, um, in, in a manner that reflects this explosion. So for me, this is, what, this is what's driven this initiative from the beginning. Yeah, and I love the way you've chosen your words because I, I think um, you, you might have um, chosen not to say sort of aren't being compensated fairly, right? Because I think one of the questions, and, and Dan, I want to get your opinion on this, um, if, if, if your bent is sort of around this interoperability, making, and I want you to sort of explain what that means, but, but one of the things that I think we too often hear in the arts generally is, well, artists aren't being paid fairly. We need more of the working class music or uh, middle class music or all this stuff. And, and my pushback on that, and I, as I say, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seemed like you, you chose them very carefully. 
we don't really know what fair is because we can't set prices and actually measure supply and demand because of all the intermediaries. So, I mean, Dan, can you build on that a little bit as it relates to the interoperability of systems? Sure. I think uh, kind of to piggyback on, on what Pano said, I, I think 10 years from now we'll all look back and see this last 20 years of the Internet as like this, this vague vagary that happened, an anomaly that happened. And I like to talk about this pendulum that sways. And on this side are the creative people, people who write music, compose music, write books, invent things. There's a supply chain that swings over to here. And at the extent of that supply chain over here is Amazon and, if you th and, and Apple as well. So as the supply chain swings over there, there's less compensation available for those who create, invent, make music and musicians and stuff. So that was an over, uh, under underlying drive for this to, 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 to support Panos' view. So, so tease that out a little bit. Like I know it's clear in your head, but so um, are you saying that Amazon and Apple on this side, the pendulum has swung too far to, like, what, what do Amazon and Apple represent in that They that egregiously schema? take too much revenue out of the value chain for providing nothing but a delivery and trucking service. Perfect. Okay, thank okay. you. Yeah, so, so, you know, so I mean, don't beat around the bush, Dan. Bluntly you know. stated, yeah. you know, they've sort of ripped off the entire uh, economy. So like, uh, so one of the things that I think we're bringing to the table is technologies that can help correct that. And everyone thinks that these large companies uh, can never be overtaken. Well, you know, I've been involved in some really large companies that were overtaken. You sure. know, so like, mm -hmm. it, it's doable. Uh, None of us are using our Nokia phones. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a great example, you know. But in terms of the interoperability, I, I think the way things change is market force mm -hmm. and. Typically, what's driving things now is market force, i.e. Apple has a dominant position, Spotify has a dominant position. But there's a bigger thing, a higher order thing here, which is called a coordinating device. And th he who has the market share is the coordination, providing the coordinating device for the entire ecosystem. Our view on the OMI is for the music sector and actually the whole creative class economy is that there needs to be a new coordinating device and Berkeley was in a unique position to convene it, right? So OMI is a coordinating device. I love it. And okay. so sort of an instigator. And we can talk about some of the, the, the technological substrates of that coordinating device. But there is, a, there is, and this is a good one for Michael, there's a human, there's a human element around this coordinating device, too. I, I, I'm not a fan of, you know, people. So um, I, I like to do things with technology. You, you are a fan of, of human beings. And so how does, how does that interplay in this? I'm a fan of all of you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, what, the way I look at most problems and the way we do at IDEO is that most problems are first human behavior problems, and then secondarily, a business model will come along or technology will come along to help uh, it enhance or encourage a behavior. So um, in this case, what, one of the biggest things we've been looking at through OMI is the issue of trust. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, there's... Um, even today, I mean, there's plenty of industries getting along pretty well. This industry doesn't, right? And trust is one of the big reasons it doesn't. There's just not a lot of um, value given to uh, what people say about what they know, about what they're paying or who they're paying. Are you talking about academia or music? In <laughs> 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 I don't know. <laughs> music, I thought. Yeah, yeah, right. um, yeah so... For what's been interesting to us then is to get involved and say, how can we uh, make behaviors more transparent? Mm -hmm. How can we help build trust between uh, all the parties involved so that we can get to a better business model? So, so I mean, you said something, you said lots of interesting stuff, but, but you said that, as I think, you said that, that human, human behavior pushes design? Was that, is that accurate? You, you say the human, okay. So it inspires it. So would you say then that, that if you look at music, there was sort of this human behavior where music was meant to be a sort of communal gathering thing or whatever, it was a social instrument. It then got retrofitted into a fungible, tangible good as a CD or whatever. Now it's been broken back up into ones and zeros and therefore shareable information again. So now humans are actually kind of able to do what they always wanted to do with it. Is that, is that fair or an over, overstep? Um. I mean, that's all true. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it gets more complicated in that the, p the different players involved view that that's my point. breaking up. That's my point. So it's broken up, and now we don't know how to piece it back together. You look like you want to jump in, Thomas. 
Um, yeah, um, I, I think that you know it's going to be it's, it's it's important for us to sort of set the tone for wh what does OMI do and why does it do it, right? Uh, and why does why is there even a need for such an initiative? And why are we on stage? And why is Berkeley leading the charge? I think we we answer the first one uh, or the last one. This is an industry that's gone through tremendous disruption over the last twenty odd years, um, and in many ways, I think we talk about all the changing ways that music is being consumed, and, and that's what you hear. Well, it's no longer a CD, it's no longer an LP, it's no longer a cassette, um, it's digital, it's not about buying, it's about renting. But we also um, need to acknowledge that the way that music is being created has changed tremendously over the last 20 odd years. Well, arguably longer than that, but there has been a proliferation and an explosion of new ways of creating music. Pro Tools, etc. Pro yeah. Tools, GarageBand, yeah. and now everybody in this room, even the non-professional music makers, is arguably a creator, right? We can take any creative um, work and add to it and release it out there in the world. So the challenge that the industry has, largely because of the way that it's evolved over the years, is that there is not a single uniform way that the industry can identify ownership of an asset, a song, a recording, across the entire value chain that we call the music industry. What's the value chain? Well, think about it, right? From the minute that you go and record music using um, a Pro Tools or a Garage Band, all the way to somebody listening to that piece of music through a Sonos, there is a number of different intermediaries. Any of you who are in the music industry will recognize the names of a manager, a record label, a performing rights society, a publisher, a streaming service, the list goes on and on and on, a mechanical collections agency and so forth and so on. Well, think of all these different players having their own databases and ways of taking into account what they're playing and who they owe what to whom but none of these systems talk to one another. So unsurprisingly, because of the lack of a shared architecture across this ecosystem, a lot of money that ought to be driven to the people that are making it doesn't really find its way to those people, right? Some of it will say it's by design. <laughs> Some of it will, will, will say it's by because of evolution. It doesn't really matter. So whether or not obfuscation in the music industry is a feature or a bug, it's insignificant. At the end of the day, what's really important is that this is an industry that in order to advance has to create a shared digital architecture that enables uniform identification of ownership across the entire value chain. And this is even more urgent because of what I said when I started this um, this talk, that the ways that music is being created is changing exponentially. So with the proliferation of user-generated content, remixes, mashups, new platforms like virtual reality, augmented reality, IO, Internet of Things, whatever you may, you may call it, there is an increased urgency for the industry to acknowledge this issue and get ahead of it for the first time perhaps in its history, not to be reactive, but be proactive. And the last thing that I'll say is that the industry has a unique chance to do this if it recognizes its role in actually um, helping catalyze the adoption of new innovations historically. So whether that's called radio, cable television, peer-to-peer -peer technology, social media, um, miniaturization of storage media, the music industry has been a catalyst for that to become um, a uh, to become popular. Sure. So if we if we acknowledge that strength we have as an industry and get ahead of this issue, then I believe that in five to ten years from now, when some of the Berkeley students actually are beginning to hit um, the beginning of what's hopefully going to be a prosperous career in music, you're able to recognize a lot of more of that money that is being consumed right now and spent. There's a reason why Apple is a $700 billion business and Google is a $400 billion business, but somehow I don't hear of any company in the creative content space 
demanding those multiple uh, multiples, right? Yeah, so let's talk about that a little bit. So, um, yeah. So Dan, you you've had real line of sight on emergent technologies as they go from sort of disruptive in the in the Christensen sense of the word, the very beginning of the of the adoption curve, mm -hmm. to the majority, right? And and the thesis around how these jump the chasm from the you know Jeffrey Moore idea would be you know either people get to do new things without having to learn new skills, the DVD player, mm -hmm. or it adopts because yeah it's I don't really understand this, but it's so fucking cool. I'm going to use it, the iPod, right? So um, give us a little bit of perspective on whether it was VoIP or others. That, that, To my mind, there's at least some parallel between what's going on now and how that matriculated. And is it consistent with Panos's view that you do need these sort of industry stakeholders to sort of all coalesce under the same tent? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a couple of questions in there, you know? One mm. is like the Well, it's like a buffet of questions. Yeah, I know. Yeah. But I, I told everybody I took two B12s before I sat on this panel with yes. George because he presses my brain cells so severely. Um, Thank you. So what um, I, I think there's a structural question which informs how OMI got structured in the, in the multi-stakeholder model that we've got. And part of the uh, value proposition, say, for a label is that this coordin coordinating device gives everyone a seat at the table. And if you don't join the party, you'll be Napstered again. So, and point being is everyone's going to be Napstered anyway because innovation waits for no one, sure. you know? So the OMI throws the party that allows everyone to participate and, and at least get their opinions in there. You know, I, and I, I, then I think about there's been a big drive towards something that uh, a lot of people have talked about as uh, minimally viable data. Mm. And we, we flipped it over and said, actually, that's not it. It's minimally viable interoperability. There you go. And the reason we said Par that... Par that, I mean, uh, to talk about interoperability is yeah, a term well that we all throw... I mean, to just talk sure. about... Sure. Uh, and, and this is informed by something that happened to me 20 years ago, you know, with VoIP and with streaming. So today, everybody can watch YouTube videos and watch video on their phones and stuff. And there's a, a, a standard that evolved called real-time streaming protocol. So that came out of work that my first company did. And the coordinating device at the time was a company called Netscape, which is who we were. So we had market force. But on, on the other hand, there are lots of companies doing streaming and VoIP, and they use different encoders. And so if you encoded one way, I couldn't decode you, right? To me, that's what minimally viable data is. It sort of doesn't matter. What matters is an abstraction layer that says we'll, we, we shall all be interoperable. Sort of a, a Turing complete kind of. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, um, I'm not as smart as you on all Turing things, George. You know, so <laughs> who, who is? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just like an engineer. You yeah, know, right. I mean, I think uh, building in this level of interoperability into an architecture allows things to communicate and relate and collaborate with each other. So, uh, I think in an industry like the music segment, there's all kinds of data, and we do have standards that exist and are highly relevant. DDAX, as an example. Yeah. But however, my company versus your company, we may only use a subset of those data types. I, and to Ponus's right. point, maybe intentionally, right? Exactly, you know, yeah. yeah, because depending on your business model and stuff, all we're saying is, hey, that's cool, as long as we can share and interoperate on that. That way, every single company can have its own implementation, and as long as we talk to each other, it works. And this is essentially how VoIP converged, and it's how, it's how streaming converged also. And ultimately, I mean, unfortunately, you know, in, in this, uh, you know, capitalist model, there will be a gorilla at some time oh, sure. who will, the, the coordinating device will actually wind up being the market. Because I think ultimately the market always sets the standard. I mean, standard, another thing about the OMI that's so cool is it's not top down. Top down standards never work. You know, we can look at, for example, the W3C. Wonderful. You know, it's great. But like, what really mattered was what Internet Explorer did, Microsoft did, and what Netscape did, yeah, and then yeah. Firefox. So Standards, protocols follow transactions. I think so, yeah. We have you to know, facilitate so transactions. So, I'm sorry. I yeah, know. well, I, 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 th yeah, I think we're saying the same thing. You know, in, in a sense, the top-down standards provide a construct, but the adoption standard, which is when, we, when people say, the iPod's really cool. They can cool. build a business on this, yeah. Yeah, that's the, the ultimate coordinating device is what we all love. Yeah, I, I love that. And yeah. so, so Michael, I mean, this idea, what, what, what you and your company 
do does um, so well, whether it's my favorite example, the Swifter, right? I love that you guys like all these <laughs> right? Isn't that an idea <laughs> thing? Did you guys invent the Swifter? Yeah, part yeah. Yeah, cool. Yeah. So um, so um, taking that, like, isn't that a launch pad? And you, you did some amazing work this summer that, that I was lucky to sort of be a little bit involved with um, around these labs of getting young, brilliant people like we have sitting here to envision these sort of products, for lack of a better word, with with... I think appropriate disregard for things like standards and copyright or whatever. No, no, no. I, I mean, I think it was appropriate, right? In order to sort of free them, talk a little bit about that as maybe sort of um, seen around the corner to what Dan's saying. If we can get that, it, it may be a term from you guys' company, that killer app, that thing that people, <gasps> right? I must have that. Then the standards start to coalesce around that. Did you see any of that gestating over the summer with OMI? Yeah, we definitely saw patterns. So we this summer we ran something called the open music uh, summer lab and we were looking for use cases so kind of we we all know what the music industry is like today and we know what consumption is like today and we know what making music is like today but we were interested in what early indicators are of tomorrow because that's actually where <clears throat> this will become even more important um, and so you know a lot of the the projects that came out of that start to point to where the future might be um, a lot of it was uh, you know, uh, personalized, custom created yeah. music on demand yeah, in geolocation like Kana, based on yeah, the yeah, neighborhood yeah, you're in, yeah, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, what was interesting about that is some of the ideas that the Berkeley students came up with this summer, I have, I've actually seen you were examples that, of it. In Japan or something. In like Japan, yeah. yeah. So, it's already, it's already on its own way. So, for one, ex one example, there was uh, one team had an idea for an app that it lets you choose your 10 favorite artists. And then, based upon, uh, where you are, it would take elements of each of those artists' songs, mash them up into new music um, to match your activity. All right. so it, um, it's actually a, a technically achievable idea today if you have the right data set and if all the laws would let you do that. Right. So <clears throat> you know it will, it will happen eventually that that kind of uh, experience can be had. Um, I was in Tokyo later in the summer and uh, met someone from Google who is essentially doing that right now without any marquee artist uh, is the source of the music, right? So important point. I want to sort of put place over. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So <clears throat> what that was then is you could you could walk through Tokyo and then you could listen to the neighborhood depending on the density of population, the activity of movement through the neighborhood, um, the number of what are other indicators like the restaurants, etc. And that would give you new music, right? And that so would give you the vibe of being there, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, so. That kind of scenario gets really complicated when, when you add um, musicians that have uh, different preferences for how their music is used, mm -hmm. right? Or how it might be broken up, or how it might be uh, distributed, or where, right? And not even not only the creator, but then whoever might own the different licenses sure, for or the that. players, or you know, exactly. all, all the all the people on the value yeah. chain. Yeah. So that that open music is trying to create a place where something like that could exist more easily. Because, I mean, I, I think if you really start to look forward, I mean, Panas talked about it in his introduction. I mean, if you think about how many, how many creators there actually are in the music industry itself, a couple thousand, maybe? Be generous, 3,000? Maybe, yeah. All right. And how many people are in the world? Yeah. All right. <laughs> I mean, what's interesting is, is now we are, we are in a creator moment in, across the world, right? So we're all photographers, right? We're all using Instagram, we're all using Facebook, we're Snapchat. Um, music is becoming the same thing. Yeah, yeah. And so <clears throat> what I've been saying to different members of the media of, of the OMI is that I would start thinking about flipping my business model entirely yeah. because instead of having 3,000 customers, 3 so to speak, you could have 3 million, right? Um, which I think will happen. I think, I mean, YouTube's already showing that everybody desires that, everybody wants mm -hmm. to be create. Media is the toy that we all grow up with now. And uh, what we're interested in, I think, is looking at these more complex future cases yeah. that will inform what's happening now. It, and that's situation. just it. I, I just I want to hopefully set you up here, but if I don't, just answer however you want. So, um, <laughs> Unlike Trump, I'll answer the question that I want to answer. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm sure there's a pithy remark to that, but I'm just so... My head so exploded around that. So, so, um, 
So uh, um, I, I wrote an article recently for Forbes where I talked about how I think we've reached peak curation, meaning we're, we're getting very little value around preference edges. They just keep telling us what we want. And so you opened the door. So if, if you are on Facebook and you say that you like one of the candidates, they're going to feed you more of that. If one of your friends has a differing point of view, you will sort of X them out, which then the Facebook, you'll tune the Facebook algorithm to show you more, and eventually you just replicate yourself. One of the things that I love, and so there's no value, um, and we need more collisions. One of the things that I love that you've set up here, Panos, and I think it resonates with both of these guys, is like you go to these OMI meetups, like the one we had in New York, it's a collision, right, in the very best sense of the word. You have on one hand people from Spotify, Netflix, or others, and then on the other end, startups. Was that by accident, by design, and sort of what's the intentionality around that as it relates to what these guys are saying? Um, well, to echo a bit of what Michael was saying, you know, problems are all human-made, right? I mean, and, and solutions are human-driven. So I'm not a believer that any technology, and we're going to, talk about blockchain a, a, a bit later, but technology only does, in my opinion, things that people want to do, number one. Number two, the technology works at its best when it's invisible. So we're here and we're talking about protocols and, and standards. They're abstractions. What the makes customer. them yeah. real is applications that enable us to use them at their best, and I don't even know the complexity of what's under that hood. I tell people, when I use my iPhone to make a call from Skype to a landline in Norway, the complexity of that is mind-blowing, but I don't care. I just want to get some Norwegian-sounding dude on the other end of the phone. <laughs> Why? <laughs> um, right? So, so uh, to no, and it's, it's Clark's Law, right? Any sufficient technology is indistinguishable yeah. from magic. Yeah. So um, I will caution our audience that some of this conversation may be like, what the hell is a standard? At the end of the day, what you know, for us, we're trying to do two things. Number one, enable any creator of any piece of content to be compensated for that, irrespective of where and how that piece of media or music is consumed, right? From now till eternity. Um, the other thing, which is uh, your question, we started by saying, who cares what an academic institution thinks? Who cares what a, you know, a guy like Michael or Dan or Panos or George think? At the end of the day, this is an issue that demands industry will. So who is the industry? And how can we get them to convene? Well, what we do as Berkeley, along with um, other partner academic institutions that we have in open music, like the MIT Media Lab, University College London, the Berkman Center from Harvard, and a number of other academic institutions, is that it's two things, in my opinion, are we are neutral entities. I think academic institutions can be tremendous conveners of human beings and brain power, which is the other thing. We have the luxury to look at things um, in isolation to some degree and, and, and do controlled explosions without bringing everybody down in our own academic bubbles. Right. So the fact that we started this as academic institutions and as Berkeley, where we have only one interest in mind, that is compensating the creator because that's who we educate here. Every year we release a thousand amazing, young, vibrant creators into this universe and we're hoping that they're gonna make money. Um, we wanna play an active role in creating an industry that gives them the best shot at making money because the industry is at its best still tough, let alone if you can't get paid money that you're supposed to be paid. So we said, number one is using our neutrality as academic institutions to convene people. So who do we convene? Well, in open music right now, we're at 120 companies. This involves all the three major labels, Sony, Universal, Warner, big music publishers like BMG. The labels are in with their respective publishers like Sony, ATV, and Universal Music Publishing. On the streaming side, YouTube, Pandora, SoundCloud, Spotify. We talked about Netflix. Um, have joined the initiative. We have a number of big um, uh, performing rights societies in, like SOCAN from Canada, CSAC from the United States. Intel. Um, Intel joined from the technology standpoint. We just announced it uh, yesterday. Um, this is critical. Why? Because at the end of the day, we live in a real world where these are the power brokers. 
And then also very critically, we brought in over 40 startups that are innovating in the space because they're the ones that are driving the changes. And our pitch to them was, look, we're not going to agree on everything as a business. As a matter of fact, we're all suing each other. However, we can all <laughs> agree to one thing, which is that compensating the rightful owners of music whether that is the original creator and or another entity that has the rightful ownership of that piece of content is absolutely critical because without that, this industry doesn't exist. So we focus them on one objective, not manifold. And the other thing we, we, we said is that um, let's come together as an industry because sharing benefits all. And the example that I used to most is, whether it's right or wrong, maybe Dan will be able to correct me, but I said, look, the airline business, they all compete with one another. But I didn't agree on some accepted fly pass, everybody's dead, right? Nobody says, my fly path is my uh, um, uh, competitive advantage. You shouldn't know where I'm flying, man, right? Because I'm consuming the less fuel, and I'm getting there in the fastest time and the most accurate way, and hey, I don't care, I'm getting paid, right? If you don't disclose your flight, flight path, and if you don't come with some agreed information that we all share, everybody dies. So I'm like, do we want to be dead? Um, and I think we, we, know, we know what the answer to that question usually is. No. Yeah, no. <laughs> so, so. Not yet. <laughs> what, you're, what you're sort of positing is this idea that if you create this collision in which you've got the incumbents on one hand and the startups on the other hand, that at some point there may be some interoperability around them. What tends to happen is that some st some incumbents are able to reinvent themselves to some certain degree, or they die out, and some of the startups tend to replace those. Dan, what 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 hints do we look for in the marketplaces of these sort of emerging types of technologies that there is traction gaining? I mean, what what have you seen in the past? Um, I guess the way to I, I think about the question is. We're talking about the structure of the Oman, right? Okay, and why the structure is what it is. So it is what it is based on experiences we've all had, and it's fundamental. You know, we say different by design. It is. It's based on several years of research we did. We were at MIT. We looked at ecosystems and how they work, and we essentially derived this idea that there are five key components in an ecosystem: you know, industry, academia, government, people, i.e., entrepreneurs, and capital. So. And I think one of the reasons this kind of thing has failed for the music industry in the past is, I hate to sound too geeky, but uh, now that everyone's on, in social networking, everyone understands the power of the graph. Social graph. You know, yeah, the social graph, and it's, 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 it's a network graph. You know, and like, you're a node and I'm a node and our connection is the edge. And what this is focused on is the edge connections, and what we uncovered is in the most resilient ecosystems, the edge connections are the strongest. Sure, it's the weak tie theory. Yep. Yeah, so therefore what you do is you pull, we, we use that as a, as a construct for the OMI to pull the ecosystem together in a coordinating device way. Collisions. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. so maybe it's controlled collisions, but it is pretty fascinating when we had the meeting a few weeks ago in New York with the first tech, tech meeting, there are vastly competing players there. Right? Oh, and, oh, yes. I mean, there are startups who totally intend to disrupt everything. Absolutely. And then there are, there are, you know, labels who actually need sustainability and there are artists who feel like they need to get paid and everything else. So uh, what drove this thing is an ecosystem model. Yep. And I think that's, that's a, a key indicator. Um, when we talk about how, how it all interoperates, I think there's some things, like as a computer scientist, things seem they're, like they're new, but they're really not. You right. know? So sure. like, uh, from day one, if you wrote software, you wrote software in modules sure. with interfaces, right? You know, and when we talk about the MVI, what we're talking about is not the nodes, and I think this is where the industry failed before. It talked about the nodes, yeah. the players. The edge connection is the API. Nice. That's so the for interface. those who don't know, API is an application protocol, application protocol interface where two, two uh, machines can talk to each other. Yeah, exactly. So um, we're focusing on that, and that actually gets to something in like the tech space you call the reference implementation. Sure. Which is you prove that it works and people build stuff, right? On top of so it, yeah. yeah, so we're, so maybe, I know that's a, a separate topic we want to get no, no, to. No, 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 I mean, go ahead. It, it, and just before you go there, I, I think it's, um, someone who hasn't had my class, because it relates back to Ponis's point, um, just wild guess, when did Nintendo start as a company? 
Anybody have any ideas? Ah, you can get one. <laughs> so he knows the answer. So he's right. 1830. So and most people who guess say, I don't know, 70s or something like that. They're an example of a company that's been around for since 1830 that has been able to kind of continue to innovate and change and stick around. That that's what's facing a lot of these companies, and some of them will. But but yeah, continue to go down that that path a little bit about building on top of this this sort of substrate. And do you want to introduce the dreaded blockchain uh, component into this? Well, or is I think the so w if you read about the OMI, we don't say blockchain. Oh, I know. Okay, and that yeah. that was actually very deeply discussed mm -hmm. and contested. Yeah. It still is. It still, it still, is. still is, yeah. Um, at the end of the day, though, I mean, a blockchain is a distributed ledger. It's a ledger. And if you kind of boil this all down... People get confused by ledger. I, I tend to say it's a database. It's a dynamic database. That people yeah, say like like that. Dan, Dan will I, I challenge have, I have you. violent reactions. I, I know you do. Oh, but, but like, I mean, <laughs> we had to get here eventually. We've all been <laughs> way too nice up to now this point. George but is yeah. when George is going to yeah. kill me. Yeah, right. uh, it is not a database. Uh, well, okay. yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. No, it's not. <laughs> okay, so yes, it is. It, it, it's it. <laughs> it doesn't have a query language, George. It's not a database. Yes, it does. It has. It has. It has I don't, the interledger could be its query language. Blah 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 blah. The, 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 the point. The point. The, the, basically, it's a way to track things. And what are we talking about here? We're talking about the provenance something yeah and blockchain is good at doing that a, a ledger is good at doing that it's, so it's good at that for those who don't know because once you ascribe something to a blockchain right typically when we think of the blockchain right now we think of the bitcoin blockchain but lots of people have their own blockchain ethereum etc um intel um and once you put it up there in theory at least you can't ever sort of take it down it's like a wikipedia entry you mm -hmm. can always see the the, the provenance yeah you it, there's a there's a revision control mechanism where you can revise it but everybody will see that it was revised so that's what the provenance is. So if, if to go back to what Pano said, so someone's in their apartment, and, and tied in with Michael said, there aren't 3,000, there are 30 million people who, there are, you know, who knows how many hundreds of millions of people who are creators now. But they capture and encapsulate that identity into this ledger. It will let forever be known that they did it. Right. And then you can track that through the supply chain, right? And the supply chain is... It's a streaming service, you know. It's it's a it's a download. It's an MP3. It's 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 a lot of things, right? And and to build on Dan's point, again, for some people in the audience, the word blockchain is brand new. Um, and I like to say when I have these discussions about blockchain, it's like talking about the internet circa 1994, where for most people is a com complete abstraction. And to this day, most people can't really tell you what the internet truly is. They know what it does, and they know what it does for them. And, you know, I don't know if you should care. I mean, uh, you know, if you're not a technologist. Well, I mean, people think of the internet, they think of the WWW layer of the stack. That's, that's all fine. they think. Yeah. You know, um, the interesting thing about this distributed ledger, to, to Dan's point, is that it records transactions. And humanity is based on trust of transactions, right, ultimately. And the music business is uniquely complicated because... A song, again, I'm going to try and boil it down in as simple language as possible, has two types of rights ownership, right? There is the recording of the song, and then there is the composition. Well, think that today, so I talked about the increasing complexity of the creation of music, which means that there are multiple owners related to that song. Right now, there is no way for this entire value chain of music to be updated every time a new owner right, has taken hold of an existing piece of work. But think of the increased complexity with user-generated content or other type of media where there are new owners added sometimes in real time. From so remixing or sampling. From remixing or sampling. Um, actually, just yesterday, a startup from Greece, who I know, emailed me this amazing thing where they're using artificial intelligence to decode remixes and break them down into all the different bits and pieces that made it, That's right? Really important. Yeah. Which is really important. But what's exciting about blockchain is that because it records transactions in a way that's inalterable, you're able to track origin and all the different people that have been involved in the creation of something new. 
So this is important because when it comes to remuneration or compensation of these owners, this can now become a reality, which is what has us excited. So it's part of what has us excited. I mean, to me, to add to that, what, what has me excited is the, the possibility that, that machines can, can now create deals without human intervention. I want a song for my taco shop. I do a search for that. I find a song that has the requirements that I want with a price tag attached to it. They make a love match, and there's no Harry Fox, there's no ASCAP, there's no label, there's no no one in the middle through this this function of most blockchain technology called smart contracts. So yeah, I mean, I think and that where, speaks where, to where, Michael's where, three million. You know, right? Well, where we could go is a world where the industry doesn't think. You know, the software industry thinks of abundance, right? Let me. If you're Facebook, you think I want as many people to consume my product as possible, and I will get paid for it. You think that the more people you reach, the better you are. In the music industry, because we've lost control of the product that we're making and we don't really know who's consuming it, we're thinking of restriction, and it's scarcity. a complete scarcity. mindset yeah. scarcity. Yes. Yeah. Right, so the opposite of abundance is scarcity. So we believe that, I mean, even with the labels, when I was, you know, when we were trying to bring the labels in, in the open music principles that the three of us crafted, we have one area that's one that says, music ought to be accessible anywhere and everywhere. And then we say something provided the right people are getting compensated. And the labels wouldn't want to, you know, they, their lawyers would argue with me because they were freaked out about this one thing. What do you mean music ought to be accessible everywhere? And I'm like, it already is. It's just nobody getting, getting paid for it. So, again, we, we believe that this new technology blockchain, which has certain attributes like the creation of scarcity, the ability to track origin, the ability for uh, what they call smart contracts or to program the assets that are there so if certain conditions are met, then... The sure. stakeholders involved sure. can be paid or whatever. Some of these things are exciting, but we're not there yet. We're starting at the very beginning, which is saying, well, let's just all agree to build this shared architecture around this technology. Yeah. And then on top and, of that, and, we'll innovate. And you and I uh, disagree, but we have sort of slightly opposing views on this. It's like, I think we are there yet. I mean, I, I know from firsthand experience that people are building this and ascribing things to call them ledgers, call them. Go ahead, Dan. Well, this was my point yeah. uh, with the labels where. If you don't participate, you're going to get Napster. Right. I mean, this is happening. Yeah. Uh, it's just that you know there's a combination of technology and and coordinating device. So like you need to get distribution. So there could be two men and a dog, you know, in Israel who made like the killer platform. But if nobody licenses or uses it, it doesn't even really matter, you know. So uh, that's got a lot to do with it. And uh, another thing, I just I just want to get really clear here is as we talked about how we position what this is, and we decided not to say blockchain. We said distributed ledger. I think we need to be really clear that Bitcoin's gotten, you know, it's, it's in the news, right? Sure. I mean, it's being talked about, and it's based on blockchain. We want to be as arm's length as possible away from anything that has coin attached to it. I think any sure. coin architecture is fundamentally at risk. I mean, there have sure. already been Ethereum, problems. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, a reason we brought Intel in yeah. is because Intel is essentially agnostic. Yeah. It's a substrate layer of technology that can be used that has literally no risk for the kinds of things that Bitcoin does. So yeah. when we think about OMI, let's not think about digital currency. It's you know? an important point. I mean, my, my line on that is always that, that um, Bitcoin is to the blockchain as pornography was to the Internet, a, a potentially necessary but gross thing that other non-gross things were built upon. Um, you but, you'll be the great keynote speaker for the next Bitcoin conference, to say that. Yeah. Well, yeah, probably, <laughs> right? Um, and they can pay me in Bitcoin. But um, so, so, Michael, one of the great things that, that IDEO does um, is sort of draw in seemingly disparate or ortho orthogonal sort of analogs around, you know, different vectors, right? And so g give, give us some perspective on, like, what we're trying to do here. Is there any 
vantage points that you guys sort of see. And I remember I'm thinking back to the uh, to the summer lab where you brought in someone from sort of the food industry, you know, and said, you know, these challenges. And, and I think the music industry is terrible at this, like considering what we're doing as just pure. This is completely original and unique. Like there's no this is very, very hard. Right. It's like, and I, I always get yelled at. It's like, this isn't that fucking hard. People are put, going to Mars. You know, it's not, so give us some context on that. Yeah, we, we, do, no, we um, do. Sorry, we did have somebody tell you that it was more difficult to solve this issue than to send somebody to the moon. Do you remember that? And he and I were yelling at each other. I said, I don't think it is. It's like the 500-pound hacker, right, on the bed. Did you love that line? I don't think it's a 500-pound hacker. You know, but go ahead. We did go to the moon, right? Yeah. Uh, well, I know, if you believe. We did go right? to Mars, yeah. though. I know. Yeah, I think it was, it was Kubrick, yeah. Yeah, so we we often look at adjacencies when we're when we're uh, designing because uh, more often than not something has been solved in a similar space it just hasn't been transferred to the space you're talking about and food is one of those so um, you're probably aware it's as you read the news that there's a there's a lot of conversation right now about uh, the supply chain of food do we actually know the provenance of our food do we know who grew it do we know what's in it. Um, and it's funny it's taken us this long to ask, actually ask that question because it is such kind an important, important fact yeah. <laughs> for our lives. And, and yet, when you, when you go to the store and you look at the labels on your food, you, you don't get a lot of information. You're not sure how accurate it is. There's no, there's no verification. So there are um, several companies right now trying to solve that problem. right? Um, and we're working with Target right now. Um, they have developed, uh, they're looking at it from a number of angles. One of them is using a technology to create a, um, a new database of food that says, yes, we can verify this came from this particular farm packed by these particular people, uh, fertilized in X way, it traveled here to you, you know, and all along you the value chain. Right, right, exactly. So <clears throat> food is actually a, a very complicated as well, right, because um, one, it's seasonal, so we're shipping food all over the world all the time now that isn't necessarily in season for the particular geography we're in. So we, we do need to understand where it's coming from and who's been growing it. Um, it's also, uh, you know, it's, we, when we're buying a brand, you know, that brand didn't necessarily grow that food. Right. They've purchased it from someone who's purchased it from someone else who's purchased it from someone else. So Lots of different um, rights holders. In exactly, years. exactly. So uh, we brought those people in to talk to uh, our members because we thought, there's an interesting adjacency, right? If if we if we could understand the the origin of an apple and how it travels through the supply chain, and we can identify that in a store, and you can get to the point now where I can get that piece of fruit and I can tell you everything about my piece of fruit, not a generic piece of fruit. That's a pretty good space to be in, and we're we're close to that right now yeah. in food. And and there are companies that you know that are, are are closer than anyone would believe about sort of blockchainifying items, right? Where so. As tragic as it is to talk about, when we continue to have this sort of steady stream of IEDs, and you're able to see all the disparate pieces that were come together, and then find out the, the root source of these things. I mean, this is, and, and you know, my thesis for the last 25 years is music is a canary in a coal mine. As goes the music business, other businesses tend to follow, and and it, it's interesting, other industries rather, because the music industry is late to adopt. But it goes back to your earlier point about sort of consumers drive this, right? Napster was a very very genuine just human emotion i have some music i want to share it right that's a very human emotion what we've been unable to do so far is to sort of track that process right and then to ascribe the actual sort of provenance of those elements and then to to, to monetize it as it may or may not be fit right well, does that and, and does that take the labels and the publishers out of business Thomas, or well and and by the way george just mentioned napster and for those of you for whom the concept of a distributed ledger is an abstraction, to some degree, that's what Napster was. It's a distributed ledger, right? In it's, the sense that it, no one, oh, there was no centralization exactly. of a database. So you could see all, you know, you, you could see all the. You know what works for me? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but but Napster is still an abstraction. What's not for these guys is uh, torrent sites. Torrent sites is a really easy way to understand distributed ledger. I want the new Beyonce record. I start downloading that on BitTorrent or whatever, right? I then become a seeder as well. That's a that's a nice sort of heuristic yeah, yeah. for BitTorrent. That's a great way of putting it. Um, you know, will will the concept of a label be around in 10, 15, 20 years? 
my personal view is yes, but perhaps not in its current state. Um, I do believe that there will always be a need for a coordinating device of sorts around an artist to be able to help them maximize their, their value. I, I really believe that. Um, and we live in an era where we could do many, many, many things on our own, right? You could tr trade stocks on your own. You can, you can do just about anything, but you still go to experts to be able to get advice and, uh, and guidance. I mean, it's the same thing with a college. You can learn a whole lot of things out there on your own. I think the key for me is, number one, choice. Mm -hmm. You have a choice, and 20, 30, 40 years ago, you did not have a choice. If you wanted to be a working professional in this industry, you had to be part of this particular world. The second thing is that I, what I do believe will happen is a much simpler industry with a lot less clearing houses and intermediaries, all of whom have their hat, hand in a pot that for the last 15, 20 years has gotten smaller, right? So um, what we need to be talking about is less friction. So at the end of the day, something like this will enable less friction so that ultimately more money is being driven in a more transparent way to the people that are creating, and I will say, and owning it as well, because I want to distinguish between the creator and the owner, which often may be the same. But it's, but it's not binary. Dan, you wanted to jump in. Yeah, yeah I want to tie this back to the my pendulum thing, OK? Um, and it also relates to the labels, because less friction drives value back to those who create. Because in some sense, the friction is in the supply chain with those who distribute. They, they enable friction yeah. so they can extract Intentionally, money. right? I mean, of yeah. course. Yeah. So they can make money. So if this technology can drive that friction out, it drives it back over to those who create. In terms of the labels, essentially labels are venture capitalists, right? So the, in, in the days of, you know, of social media, uh, a, a great new inventive, wonderful creative person can break on YouTube, mm -hmm. which happens all the time now. Mm -hmm. However, that's not always the case. And I, I think what's happened, if you look, if you go back to sort of like uh, maybe one of the golden eras of the music industry, which was probably the 60s in through the late 70s, mm -hmm. there were hundreds of artists on the labels. And then they moved to sort of like the big, you know, the, the sort of the Michael Jackson phenomenon, mm -hmm. where it was like the big hit. Yeah. And now it, the labels are big hit driven. I think what this will do is democratize the creation of technology or the, the, the invention of music and, and uh, creation of music and drive an ownership stake into those who create it, which then creates a new channel with less friction. At the end of the day, I, I love the pendulum thing. It's so. swinging back over here, yeah. and that's where it needs to be. And then guess what? We're going to have more wonderful music to listen to. Yeah, more yeah. art equals less war. Go ahead. I, I also yeah. want to add one another thing. Um, right now, um, I, I'm a big fan of this management thinker called Peter Drucker. Sure, sure. And... Um, Drucker talks a lot about industries and sort of what are the ways to identify whether an industry is growing and thriving um, or dying. And actually it comes to, down to a lot of people in this audience. Are young people attracted to go and work in an industry, right? Is capital flowing into an industry? Is an industry innovating? The threat that we have in the music industry is because of an overly complex, and I will say unnecessarily in today's world complex ownership structure mm -hmm. that's thwarting innovation if you were to if you and i see some people in the audience who are our students and i know that they have amazing new ideas around um streaming services and ways of music discovery curation to your point start a new streaming service today probably you need on a minimum about a hundred million dollars to get all the clearances and licenses that you need to operate on a global basis. That's an insane amount of money if you think that that's money that you'll need before you invest anything in your people and your technology and in marketing and in all the stuff that you need to run a business. If you want to start a new business in the music industry today, I will tell you probably no venture capitalist worth their salt wants to talk to you because they feel we've seen that movie and we know how it ends. It ends in a lawsuit. <laughs> um, that to me is scary, okay? If young people give up on wanting to innovate in this industry, wanting to create, if capital is not flowing in, then where is it going? 
It's going to the stupid ideas that are coming out of Silicon Valley for new taxi hailing services, right, or whatever it is. And I'm sorry, that's not what the world, may, you know, that's not what the, what makes the world go round. So, I do. One of the hopes that we have with Open Music, uh, as um, as the the co-founders, and we do consider the original members who have joined in and all the people that took the big leap to join in as co-founders, we're hoping for innovation to thrive. That if you make it easy easier to track who owns what then you know it, it's like the cable it's like cable tv right right now you buy a bundle and you pay a boatload of money i don't know about your cable bill mine i, I still don't understand why i pay 300 bucks a month in cable sure. right um but because i don't watch 95 percent of the stuff but they're saying sure. here's what it is it's the same thing if you want to start a streaming service or the pros right? exactly yeah. so anyway innovation for us is critical because it changes everything so in the in the in the 1850s, there was a famous lawsuit where um, a a party had taken a photo uh, a lithograph at a time when photography was prior to this point. If you wanted to take a, uh, a picture of someone, you had to use one of those gargantuan boxes that when you took the picture, it sort of blew up, right? And so you could take one, right? And and then lith lithography, I guess, comes into being. Someone takes a picture of Oscar Wilde, right? And and then this other party says, well, cool. I'm going to start making lithographs of this thing, right? And so all of a sudden, you have a court case. And people say, well, wait a second. You can't take this thing that I made and reproduce it without my rights. And prior to this point, it was impossible to do that because you had to either hand draw it or get these big gigantic cameras that blew up. And the case went round and round and round. And what do you know? Somehow we resolved it. And we resolved the laws. And Apple's, how many pictures are taken every day? You know, so. There, there is line of sight, but to your point, this, this sort of friction and tension that we have right now where the investment community is largely saying, yeah, uh, -uh right? And, but I, I, I have more hope and optimism about the music business than I ever have because of, call it a ledger, call it a whatever, um, th this ability. And I also think with all respect to, to the big incumbents, they have an overinflated sense of being at this point. And you talk about Drucker and industries as they start to topple. When they start to believe their own hype, there are lots and lots of creators out there who are like, yeah, what's universal, right? And and that's where the change begins to come. I do want to take some questions, Dan. But so go ahead. Well, that just prompts. Uh, now I, I've, I'm a huge user of Apple products. Yes. Uh, I have. Was, I was fortunate to work with Steve Jobs and and do deals with him. I love Apple. You know. I mean. I think. Bringing Unix to the world w was really was one of the things that he did, but if everybody remembers that 1984 commercial, or well one, yeah, sure, sure. Yep. I mean, that was thrown at the screen of IBM. Absolutely, IBM was the, at the time the, the mortal enemy. Absolutely, and I and I really hate to say it, but Apple is that company now. Uh, absolutely. It has created the most closed ecosystem environment in the world. I, yeah, and, and, and if any company and could have, if any company could have. <laughs> In, in increase the perceived value around music in the same way they do around their watches and their other devices, and they've chosen not to, and I think that that's that's bad. Yeah, yeah and I I guess my, my point is that no matter how large the gorilla is, all gorillas fall and stumble, and usually what causes the stumble is the little startup yeah, with that, that brings something, and that's why we have like 30 or 40 startups in the LMI. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a great they're point. not afraid to do stuff. You know, they're not encumbered by standards well, and stuff. They just do really cool stuff. Yeah, and, and, and that's <laughs> like as, as the, 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 the young entrepreneur doesn't have the same threat or risk around lawsuit because if they get sued, what are they going to take, their bong? You know, I mean, it's like, what, what do they have? So do we have any, do we have any questions out there from, from anyone? Hi, I'm Ian Congrey. I teach at MIT. I'm an anthropologist of Japan. Uh, I need a Nintendo uh, <laughs> you, you spoiled it for me, man. I hope you feel good about yourself, Mr. MIT. <laughs> well, comment and question. The comment is that uh, the other thing that's happened besides the internet and broadband uh, to the music industry, it seems to me, is income inequality. Mm. The minimum wage hasn't gone up. Wow. Middle class wages are flat or declining. So the money that's out there for people to spend on music has been declining rapidly. Um, I don't expect an answer to that, but I, I think if you're talking ecosystems, I think that's a bigger issue that's really part of a lot of what's happening in music. I, I will push back on that, by the way. Who will or will not? I will. Good. Uh, and, and so, but my question has to do with value chain um, and how you're thinking about the intermediaries. Because I, I think that, I mean, 
mean, I studied pop music in Japan for many years, and one of the things that happens is big commercials come out, and somebody who's a nobody artist now becomes very big. Now, the person who made that commercial says, hey, we made you the star you are. We sure. are actually the ones who deserve a cut, even though you had the original song. Sure, Apple thinks the same thing, Spotify. Too. Well, record label, that's the 360 model with record labels, by the way, but go ahead. Yeah, so the question is, how do you, I mean, it's not just getting compensation back to the original, but, you know, is Etta James responsible for Avi Chi's hit that then Flo Rida makes? And, and so in each of those steps, how do you envision dividing up that value? I love that. That's a great, I mean, I, I can take a whack at a couple of those things. First, to give credit to Dan, he didn't use his phrase, but he's got a pinna analytic framework that does view things like general macro trends and in, income inequality, and, and that is on the, on the radar of OMI as we get into things like policy and general macro trends. So it's a great point. Um, the, the element of sort of how does Etta James benefit when somebody maybe doesn't even directly sample but is kind of influenced by them, um, I did a, a big project a, a long time, or a year or so ago, with an artist named Imogene Heap. And, and part of her thesis around blockchain, et cetera, is that it allows people to share not just from a pecuniary or financial point, but influences to unearth some of these hidden elements and then gain some reward for it. So if, if I, you, you know this linkage between Etta James and Flo Rida or whatever, if you're able to sort of unearth that and share that, there may be a way to reward you for doing that to encourage more sharing, not necessarily from a financial sense, but humans share because we're social animals, right? But we still, just as we said, we can't really track that, and this may allow for that trackage. And actually, um, to that point, one of the ideas that was in the Open Music Labs that IDEO ran with us in the summertime was around that. You know, So if you're experiencing or creating new pieces of music that are borrowing elements from others, can that lead to discovery of an Etta James by somebody who is 15 years old right now and knows Florida but has no idea who Etta James is. Um, but to answer your earlier point about disposable income, so my view is that people right now spend a ton of money on music, just not directly. Um, we all have iPhones, and arguably they would be a lot less valuable than if they, there was no music accessible through them. And everybody pays for a friggin' internet subscription, one way or another. Um, and everybody goes to a restaurant, and I bet you that meal wouldn't be anywhere as enjoyable if there wasn't music somehow Nora being Jones. performed. Excuse me? <laughs> Nora, Nora Jones. Nora Jones. Uh, my Dick. point is that music <laughs> powers a lot of the devices and experiences that we enjoy and pay for. Um, so maybe the future of music compensation is not just about direct compensation, but if you can, again, track provenance, track origin, then maybe there's ways that in the future we can envision micropayments flowing to the creators even through indirect consumption. Um, so I would argue that you know uh, a day of silence worldwide where there's not a single musical note getting played would be a pretty depressing day. <laughs> and I would absolutely argue that any of the technology behemoths that are part of OMI, if there wasn't for music, they would not be valued anywhere as much as they are. And I, I want to clarify that as open music, we don't take an agenda with respect to who survives or dies or who's good or bad, um, or to some degree what's fair or unfair. Um, and I think it's important for us to, to stress if there was any um, success here is that in, in many ways we said, look, we're, we're neutral. I mean, I have, certainly have my own opinions, and in some situations we're – representing our own personal opinions here, not just you know, not the opinions of, of the broader group. Um, but that's important to stress. Will some of these intermediaries not be around in five or 10 years? Absolutely. You know, there was a time where the words AOL and Yahoo, you know, and digital equipment company, and um, you know, would strike Blackberry. fear. Blackberry. Blackberry, which today announced that it's uh, retiring its phones, and Nokia, right? These. But, but if I could just add on real quick, and I know others want to talk, but, but uh, you know, what we haven't really talked about is it's not just sort of the, the music and the restaurants. There should be a flourishing of music and health technology. Um, obviously, VR and AR lead to possibilities for mu more music integration. Um, where we want to get, and as you said, through micropayments and better transactions, music should be embedded in just about everything we do. It, it kind of already is, but it should be more structured. We're moving from an era of unstructured data, an era of sort of 
um, modeling, guessing to an, an era of measuring, right? And, and that's what this allows us to do. Your, your sort of day of science, like I just thought of like, a, we just play 433 over and over again, right? You guys get that, right? <laughs> um, other questions? Go ahead. I was actually just curious, uh, the uh, kind of blockchain ledger concepts a little bit newer to me. Uh, how's it actually represented? Uh, how's it manifested? You know, so if I'm a consumer on the end, um, is this something that's accessible to me to actually go back and track and see where the creator was and all those steps were? Or is that something kind of on a higher level that you'd have to go research somewhere else? You can see it. It's an open ledger. I mean, I can send you a link to see the hash and, and how much information is shared around that ledger um, is it, going to be dependent upon what they share. So and do you see it like kind of digitally being um, part of if I, if I buy an album? Is it is that going to be part of the the digital download, and I can just go look at it right there, or what I then have to depends take on how it's set up. And, and and what the blockchain is really lacking right now is a front end. Um, so it's still it'd be like if you were looking at um, a Microsoft comp a Dell computer running MS DOS in in you know 1985 or something. It, it's it's crufty, <laughs> right? So there's there's not a great front end for it right now. Right, but, but that stuff is. I want to push ahead. back a little yeah. on George because I mean he's a total evangelist for the blockchain thing, but um, I'm not wrong. Uh, <laughs> He's sort of wrong. Uh, <laughs> so you can see the hash in the sense that you can see the packet. I mean, you know, I if I look at my phone right now and I've got a, a Wi-Fi connection or an LTE connection, there are packets. You seeing those doesn't help you, you know. I mean, I can stick a sniffer on my network and see the packets in the same way I can stick sort of like a blockchain sniffer on onto a distributed ledger and see the hash. But the hash provides essentially no value kind of tries, ties back to what Pano said. He doesn't care how it works. And I, I think really, I mean, how many people know the uh, thermodynamics in the engine in their car? You know, like nobody knows that stuff, right? So, I mean, the point being is like inside of everything there's something really complicated. So when I said earlier, kind of the snide remark that it's not a database because the database requires a lot of things. And this goes back to the Jeff Moore thing about the whole product, sure. right? It's not a whole product. It, it doesn't have a query it's language. Front end, right? it, there it's lacking a, a front end, right? It's lacking like, a bunch of stuff, you know, but uh, I, mean, I don't think a, the blockchain... What's the query language for... I mean, are you talking about SQL? Like, what is the, like, what is the query language the, for... Databases existed before SQL, but Of Larry, course they did, but, but SQL Ellison, became the common... common. So if I have a database uh -huh. and I want people to uh -huh. write... And the I MVI. Would, exactly, and I would say that Interledger <laughs> is the common language for blockchain. Uh, uh, I know Michael wanted to add something. <laughs> 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 What's a query language? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it gets, it gets too geeky. I guess what we're trying to say is uh, it, it's, a, it's sort of like a tech widget. It's a tool that people can use to build stuff, right? Are using to build stuff. I, I do think sure. there's, I mean, we're, you're at, I think what you're asking is could you look at liner notes maybe? I mean, yeah, there you right, go. And, yeah. I, and I think, yeah, you can get, that are you can get better liner notes. That, I, that are authentic. Yeah, that have been confirmed. And maybe the person that wrote those line notes should yeah. be compensated when you look at them. Well, and, and I think it's yeah. a difference between going somewhere you can see liner notes because somebody created some super cool place where you can, you know, access all that information and seeing source code. I mean, most people don't give two dams about source code. It's there. You can access it. But unless you're Dan, you don't really care about it, you know. Um, so I think it's important to distinguish you know, between the two, that this technology, in order for it to be humanized, you need applications to be built on top of it, which is a lot, ultimately, what IDEO is doing. And, you know, this group is here for a reason. I mean, these people are co-founders for a reason, because everybody on this stage brings a different set of That's of a cool expertise. question, though. You're basically saying, what is this thing, and is it real? Can I touch it? You know, like, is it real? Because a lot of this stuff, like, people still don't know what packets are. Like, they're flying around this room right now. They're everywhere. You know? mm -hmm. so, you know, so the realness of it, I mean, <laughs> from a consumer perspective, they're all over our th They're climbing all over me, you know? It's like, but they exist. And for, I think the, the theme here is the, the coordinating device is ultimately the consumer who makes the choice. I want to make the case that before a consumer makes a choice, there's always somebody in a garage. 100%. Who gives them the, the opportunity to make that choice. And that entrepreneur in the garage creates something that humans want, and then the standards emerge on top of that. I, and the people subs matter. Yes. People matter. And the substrate <laughs> architecture will evolve to become a more common language that benefits people because they use it. It's a network effect. And we're at the early stages of that. 
others? Yeah, so I guess I have the mic, so I'll go. Uh, so I wanted to ask a question about the contracts side of things. So I, I just would love to hear thoughts about how that might work in this uh, environment or ecosystem. So for example, it would seem to me that um, you, there you need to know not just identities of the people, but you need to know that, or the entities involved, but you need to know that there was a contract. But then is it going to go so far as to say, oh, and here's like the T's and C's that were in the contract? Is yeah. it going to display that? Is it going to enforce them in a DRM kind of way? Like, right. you know, what's, what's the vision around that? Yeah, so I'm the only lawyer on the stage, I think. So um, look, blockchain, or it doesn't obviate rule of law, right? And so as we were talking about earlier, if you throw something up on any type of ledger and you don't have the rights to that and someone else then accuses you of infringing upon their rights, the rule of law is going to have to settle yeah. that. What this provides the opportunity for is a set, you said T's and C's, terms and conditions, a set of rules that could be ascribed if, that, that then when met, you have a meeting of the minds that then could execute the contract without all the corrupt, you, you, know, com, you know, Creative Commons, for instance, right? Yeah. So Creative Commons is a beautiful gesture that allows people to sort of say, okay, here are the rights for this work and you can do X and Y with it if you do something else, right? It's a Boolean sort of thing, right? You do this and, 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 and typically that is you give me attribution. The only problem with Creative Commons is machines can't talk to each other with it. And, and this is so, I mean, the sort of, the way to see it is this could be Creative Commons but with machines talking to each other, with an API, right? And, and, but it doesn't obviate issues around contracts. Arguably it will accelerate issues around contract infringement, copyright infringement. Others? Yeah. Um, have you guys looked at um, some of the more traditional ways that that um, value has been has been controlled? For instance, through the through the AFM, American Federation of Musicians, Sound Exchange, which is really working to you know through treaties to mm -hmm. to to track down. I mean, something like you're doing, but I understand that you're you know you're expanding the scope. But w what are your thoughts on that? Sound Exchange is part of Open Music. Uh, they're they're a member, um, as are uh, the AF of M is not. But um, and if they want to be, would, would welcome them. Um, as a matter of fact, I don't think we've ever made an official approach. So if anybody w knows them, send them our way. Well, the, I'm I'm actually the I do the collective bargaining here and okay. for the musicians in town. I'm a working musician, so I so I actually have right. a real interest in um, that. You know, for me, all these organizations were put in place. You know, with with good objectives in mind, right? I mean, I, I was I remember when Sound Exchange was created, and it's done a lot of good, and it's driven a lot of money to people who didn't even know that they were owed that money. But by um, many accounts, there's still money that Sound Exchange collects that sends over to the AF of M, and often the AF of M doesn't always know what to do with it because they can't always track down the non-featured performers that um, have performed in certain. Uh, in certain recordings, right? So at the end of the day, for me, it's less about legislating what bodies end up surviving. It's not our job to do this. The market, to Dan's point, this, one of the things that I've learned from working with Dan, among the millions of things that I've learned from him, is this concept that standards are not mandated, largely the markets drive them, and that's been our approach. So we're also taking the same approach about organizations. If the A F of M, or Sound Exchange, or Harry Fox, or ASCAP, or BMI still offer value 50 years from now, 20 years from now, let, let them be. That's not our job to decide. But every organization, it doesn't matter what it is, has to always ask itself, am I still relevant? Am I providing value? Is, is, is the value proposition on top of which I've been built, is it still relevant today, and will it be relevant in five years from now? And I don't think that any organization, I don't think that any government, I don't think that any country, I don't think that any nonprofit has a divine right for existence. You know, we live in a market, in, in a market driven economy, and ultimately markets will determine what survives or, or doesn't, and that will be determined by the value that that organization provides. Sound Exchange presents one really interesting sort of example in the sense that the way, as I'm sure you know, the way they work is they'll collect your money. And they'll sit on it and earn interest on it and everything else and pay salaries. 
but unless and until you register with them and prove sort of authentication that you're a real person, you can't get at that money, right? Whereas ASCAP and BMI and the collection agencies on the composition side, if they can't if they can't find you, they distribute that money out through black box money, right? And so what Sound Exchange has done by design is to create real incentive to for people to set a set of standards. And to me, that is an example of sort of how the market can dictate standards that that have an incentive behind it, i.e., money. Um, so as Pano says, maybe they have value, maybe they don't, but they have shown line of sight on how you can get people to give data. And, and, and in my prior life, you know, I started a company called Sonic Bids that has maybe 600,000 bands that are on it. And Sound Exchange would call us and say, we have all this money that's undistributed and we're trying to match it with people. Can you help us? And every year we would match over a thousand of our members um, with, pay ch with checks that were over $2,000 each, right? And we would call them up, and they, they would be like, what's the catch? So <laughs> it's crazy to me that in an era where, as, as created beings, we're all saying we're not making enough money, that somehow there's money sitting out there that's not being driven to people because they just don't know how to find them or because they don't know they're owed it. So we think that a uniform way of identifying ownership will make it super easy for Sound Exchange to distribute the money that they want to distribute. I mean, or super easy for AFM, you know, AF, AFM to distribute money that it wants to distribute. You know, I mean, sure, I, again, the music industry is not the church, okay? <laughs> like, we all know that. Um, maybe the church is not the church, but that's, a different, that's, a, that's another panel. That's for the <laughs> next, next creative entrepreneur's <laughs> conversation. Um, but I do believe that most people in this industry, you know, I, I've, I've worked with multiple industries, and, and I will tell you, most people that I've encountered in the music industry love music and want to do the right thing. They want to pay the people that are making the same. Right now, our architecture is not enabling that to happen, and that's what we're aiming to solve. Yeah, I want to uh, comment on that. So this technology can reduce friction, and it goes back to our anthropologist friend over there uh, about the disparities in income. Uh, one of the ways companies aggregate wealth is by inducing friction. Okay, so look at the software industry. What Apple's done is, you know, I, I had a mobile company. Uh, I, I don't understand why Apple gets 30%. I don't understand why Amazon gets 55%. It's because they've induced a friction function into the economic value chain that creates disparities in wealth. Right. So as the pendulum swings over here, it's, it's more broadly distributed, I think, uh, in line with who actually deserves to be paid. It is so a distribution I, problem. It it's, is, it's yeah. not It's not a scarcity problem. I, mean, I don't sound like a utopian or anything, but like technology actually can really help this problem. Yeah, I agree. Oh. I think we probably have time for one, one or two more. Uh, oh, lots of questions. I, I don't know. Somebody else, Nicole, or some. I mean, and how much time do we have, Nicole? Are we supposed to end at three? Uh, Hypothetically. <laughs> okay. Who's next? Um, hey guys. Uh, name's Dave. Uh, David Ash. I guess full name. Um, I'm a student here at Berkeley, and I don't have any like questions in terms of, I guess, criticism because I've been doing, I've been following, I guess, even through like Rethink last year, I've been coming to these events, listening to George and Panos speak a few times and it seems very, in essence, in essence simple. Like this, sh this sh isn't something that should be hard to do in the point where like, yes, people need, people who own work need to be able to track it in real time and know how they're going to make a living day to day through that creation. So, I mean, I haven't worked in the music industry like for 20 odd years or however long it is, so I can't say what has happened. So, being, I guess, young to, is kind of my advantage right now because I don't see all the hurdles. Is there a question coming yes, at some point? Yes, yeah. yes. My, um, so, I was just like kind of wondering what is the, what's next? What's the immediate future? Like, how, what is going to be the next step? I mean, I'm just talking the agenda in the next like three months, uh, like six months for all mine. How can yeah. we as students like get involved more? Great question. Great question. Uh, we'll, I'll try and be really quick so we can take other questions. Um, we've had the technology kickoff meeting. We've separated our groups in, in working groups. Uh, we're beginning to get information based on those themes. Um, and then based on that information, we will begin marching towards this concept of as Dan termed it, minimum viable interoperability. What is the minimum set of data that we can all agree to share and exchange with one another, and how can that work? 
the addition of Intel is critical because it provides a virtual sandbox for people to be able to prototype first. We have a policy summit meeting coming up at Harvard Berkman Center. Uh, it will likely be on October 28th. The latter part will be open to anybody in the audience to come and participate. There, we will talk about policy implications, what we're talking about. You know, is copyright law working on our favor or not as, as creators? Um, there will be a meeting in London on the 22nd of November for anybody who's European. And then with IDEO, um, we are going to work to hatch up what the next version of the Open Music Labs are. Last summer, we had, was it 18 students? Yeah. 18, 18 students, largely from Berkeley, participate and work with IDEO on envisioning different use cases of how this technology could be deployed, deployed in terms of capturing information and then how could you use this information if you had it. Um, so we plan to hopefully run another one next summer. Um, so stay, stay, uh, stay tuned for that. And, and look, there's, there's the site, there's the blog, get on, there's going to be a newsletter coming. And, and just yeah. I mean, get involved. You know what I mean? Like we're all here for you. We really are. This isn't hard. We could thing. use uh, basically, so I think, uh, interns to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So for the OMI, particularly the technology side, we're starting working groups. You know, we had the meeting a few weeks ago. There are, I think, five or six working groups. We, we need people who are interested to participate and help. I mean, we could clearly have people onboarded now to do stuff that matters with regards to the OMI. And, and the last thing, we need active input from creators. Yeah, right. Um, so we're thinking a lot right now because o o Open Music has, I would say, three areas of focus. There's technology, there's policy, and then advocacy and education, which I'll blend together. Um, so technology, we talked a lot about. 99% of this panel was talk, we talked about technology. But we're trying to, education is important. So we're trying to organize either work group sessions or pan, I'm, we're, we're still trying to figure it out. How do we get input from creators? You know, to Michael's point, because what IDEO does is ultimately looking for, you know, it's, uh, they like to call it human-centered design. Well, the humans in this whole equation are the people who are making this. How do you capture good information? You know, the creative process is, um, so um, uh, people get together and they write a song and they don't, they don't ask you, you know, who's your publisher? Who's your performing rights society? Who's your lawyer? Uh, God forbid, right? Um, so how do you capture good information early on? We have a lot of questions. So if you guys have ideas of what's the best way for us as open music to engage creators uh, and young people, let us know. We haven't figured out. I will tell you, we're sitting here and we look like we know things, but we don't. <laughs> And that, that was one of the topics this summer that we explored was is how what information should be captured during the creative process and how do you do it and um, there's some early ideas around you know maybe different hardware that could do that for example something that just plugs to an instrument cable that's your identity and that that has, puts a signature into a recording but we, we I think we have to get to something that probably is invisible because what we found across the board is there's uh, quite a quite a diversity of tolerance for disrupting the creative process. So it'd be great to have feedback on that or ideas. So yeah, one more question. Go ahead, Al. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> we have these large content distributors like Spotify or like SoundCloud. Why are they trying to invade and innovate in some of these sort of more outdated business models? You know, why isn't Spotify able to create a developer or, or a business-facing API where any, you know, any new startups can be streaming new music at a cent or two cents per play. Because from my experience, some of the hardest part with encouraging innovation in the industry is the barrier to entry. I want to make really cool stuff, but yeah, to do that, I need to sign a monthly contract for sure. thousands of mm -hmm. dollars with yeah. someone like Medianet or 7Digital. So why aren't we seeing people like Spotify or SoundCloud getting into the space? And can we encourage them to? Well, we, uh, look, I mean, it's a great question, and Panda sort of spoke to that issue exactly. I, I would like to think that voices and questions like that and collisions that are being architected around this make the, the, the robustness of that question more prevalent in these, I mean, I was there at the, at the tech meetup a couple weeks ago. These people were there, they're listening. Now they've got lots of stakeholders that they have to deal with. They're gonna try to do an IP. I mean, they got sharks that are close to their boat. Um, that that can be a danger for disruption. It's a great point. How, I mean, how do we facilitate something like that? I think all we can do is try to create discourse around that. And as Pano said to the other uh, person, you know, get involved. I mean, ask that question. You know, ask that question. I don't. You guys have an answer? I don't. Well, have I mean, for example, if you're in New York at the tech meetings, um, 
there, one of the working groups is, uh, it's essentially what are the features, the feature set. That's a killer feature. Yeah. You know, like your voice, what you just said was not said there. Yeah, yeah. yeah so there's a, is there, there is an ability for people to participate who have ideas. I mean, I love the fact that you asked this question earlier that it, it should seem so easy, yeah. you know. This is why new, new, fresh, young entrepreneurs matter, you know, because you'll bring ideas to the table that everyone else may think it's just too hard and just kind of, it doesn't matter. You make stuff happen. So asking questions like that yeah. sometimes is what people need to hear to kind of wake I think, up. I think know? it's really important yeah. because mo most of the members are, are um, at least our age. <laughs> Old know, so white dudes. Yeah. <laughs> so With gray hair. <clears throat> I mean, I, I would say for majority of you, the, the idea that there was a, a digital revolution is kind of funny because you just have lived in a digital world your whole life. Yeah. And so you don't have a, a sense that some kind of infrastructure has to be maintained, right? And that, that's, a, that's a highly valuable asset right now. So I, I think being able to participate in the conversations is provocative and helpful. Well, and sometimes asking a very simple question You'll be a surprise what, you know, it may, it may seem like a stupid question, but, you know, the, the legend has it that, you know, Edward Land, who invented the Polaroid, you know, his granddaughter said, you know, why can't I see the picture right now? <laughs> right? Simple question. Um, so, I, I mean, you know, Alex and Keith, they're, you know, they have a, an awesome company um, called Dropler, and their idea is amazing, right? It's about the social discovery of music. And they come and see me, and you know, I, I know that right now the odds are stacked against them, not because their idea is not great, not because they're super sharp guys, um, but because getting all the licenses, you know, just going through 7 Digital, you probably have to spend five, six, seven grand a month for a teeny startup just to be able to get music. For Crazy. For a, in a one-year contract, right? <laughs> Or Thomas is somewhere here. He has an idea for a chatbot to recommend concerts. I've seen it work. Yeah, it works. Good luck, right? Because, again, of all the rights issues, th we need these minds. That's, this is what we need in open music. And we need to wrap up. Um, yeah. So uh, thank you all. Thank you guys very much. But before you start applauding, this is a conversation. There are ways to engage and get involved. I mean, great question, great final question. Please do uh, help us propel this forward. Thank you all so much.